This is a lecture that's almost a repeat of a lecture from last semester called the same thing, Theory of Periodic Structures or something very close to that. Uh, there might be four or five new slides here, but pretty much the same thing. And I, I want you to see it twice. This is very important information. We won't delve too deeply in this lecture on the theory of how periodic devices work electromagnetically. This lecture is more the math describing the periodic structure. So in a way, it's more of a geometry lesson than an electromagnetics lesson. But near the end of the lecture, we're definitely going to talk about the implication, implications on the electromagnetic wave in these structures. So what is a periodic structure? Well, there is a lot, a lot of things in electromagnetics that come from periodic structures. We can have diffraction gratings, and when light passes through that, it disperses, much like a prism. We have photonic crystal fibers and integrated optical devices based on photonic crystals and periodic arrays of holes. We can have periodic lattices where we put a defect in there and we can trap electromagnetic energy at this defect if we design this to have a band gap. There's nowhere for the electromagnetic energy to go and we can trap it. The very first left-handed metamaterial in the world, that was a periodic structure. Many times antennas can become periodic, phased array antennas, antennas based on band gap materials. Slow wave devices tend to be based on periodic structures because we slow the wave down through dispersion. Uh, there's a type of a device called a frequency select a surface. It's a planar array of either metallic elements or holes in a metallic screen. And this is part of what makes a stealth aircraft stealthy. Anyway, there's just many, many examples of periodic structures and we didn't even get into the periodic structures in nature, the things that make the morpho butterfly blue, the, the eye on a peacock feather. So many, many periodic structures out there and they have very interesting electromagnetic properties. Now, in this lecture, when we're talking about something periodic, we could certainly be looking at the atomic scale and we have a periodic arrangement of atoms. But in fact, that's not what we're talking about in this lecture. Instead, we're talking about periodicity on a larger scale. Uh, so for at microwave and radio frequencies, the size of these structures are big enough that we could stick our fingers through the holes and we could play with the structures. For optical frequencies, well, they're much smaller. So we're talking about a much larger scale periodicity than atoms and the waves enter these materials, they bounce around, they do funny things, and we get some pretty crazy behavior out of it. So. I want to introduce briefly the math describing periodic structures. I don't want this to be a comprehensive treatise in solid state physics, but I will touch on some basics. First of all, there's 230 space groups. That's the most specific way of defining how something can be periodic in three dimensions. We can make some simplifications and assumptions and we can reduce that down to 32 crystal systems. And then we can say, just assume that the entire lattice is made up of the same size spheres everywhere. And it turns out our 32 crystal systems then reduce down to the 14 Brave lattices. And that's what we'll spend most of the time on. And most of the time when people are talking about periodic structures, they use terminology from the Brave lattices. It's, it's not as common to see it come from space group or, or crystal classes. And then we can generalize even further just from the shape of the unit cell, not necessarily looking at the arrangement of the, of the structures within the unit cell. We can reduce that down to seven crystal systems. So we could ask, well, how do we even define how things are periodic? Well, there's what's called symmetry operations. We can start with a lattice and then we can do something to it. We can translate our position we can flip the lattice left and right, we can rotate it, we can do a whole bunch of things. And if we do an operation to the lattice and we end up with a lattice that looks the same, well that means something. And we can compile lists of these tests and based on what symmetry it happens it would pass some tests and not others. So we use these symmetry operations to 
rigorously and mathematically define how things are periodic and what class it is. So, as I mentioned, we can talk about space groups. There's 230 of those. Much more commonly, and what we'll talk about in this class, are the 14 Brave lattices and then the seven crystal systems. So here are the 14 Brave lattices and the, the seven crystal systems. The crystal system are the, the capitalized bold letters. We count one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. And what we see is that there's three types of cubic symmetries, two types of tetragonal, four types of orthorhombic, two types of monoclinic, and then one triclinic, trigonal, and hexagonal. So if we add all of them up, we get 14 Brave lattices. And so we can visually see now the relation between the 14 Brave lattices and the seven crystal systems. We can talk about Brave lattices in two dimensions in which case there's five. There's also hybrid symmetries, and a very famous one is the diamond lattice. In fact, the diamond lattice has face center cubic symmetry. We can get a little bit more specific about the, the, the flavor of face center cubic symmetry, if you will, and we can think of it as two face center cubic unit cells where one is offset from the other along the extreme diagonal by a quarter of a lattice constant. And then we get the diamond lattice. Then if we go into the diamond lattice, we make some changes to the size of certain things, we'd call that zinc blend. But the reality is the zinc blend and diamond, they're both diamond symmetries, and both of those are face center cubic symmetries. And there's other examples of this that I don't want to get into, but just recognize that there are these hybrid symmetries out there. But they always reduce down to one of the 14 Brave lattices. I also want to take a moment to talk about, in, for planar arrays, the hexagonal symmetry and one big benefit of it. And actually, we'll talk about two big benefits. But one is that it has a, a very high packing density. If we look at the two lattices shown on this page, we see a square array of circles and a hexagonal array of circles. And they're the same size circle. But notice there's less empty space in the lattice on the right. It's a much higher fill fraction. Uh, if we go through the math here, it turns out it's about a 15% higher fill fraction. Also, if we design a device based on square symmetry and design a, a, an equivalent device based on hexagonal symmetry, usually the hexagonal arrays have a response or spectra at a lower frequency than the square arrays. This really means that we can have larger structures for a given wavelength. Now that's good if we're designing this for a very high frequency and our features are, are going to be very small and maybe very difficult to manufacture. Well, if we can go to hexagonal array, maybe we can get away with slightly larger structures. This is also very beneficial at optical frequencies where we have the same, same type of limitation. Also, the hexagonal array tends to have better symmetry than the square arrays. Usually that's beneficial. There are times where it's not. For example, a hexagonal guided mode resonance filter tends to have more resonances than something that has a square array. The higher degree of symmetry in that case gives us more resonances. And we'll, we'll talk about that in the lecture where we, we cover guided mode resonance. Now let's get into the specific math describing the periodic structures. So we describe a periodic lattice using what we call lattice vectors. And these come in two types. We have what's called the primitive axis vectors. The axis vectors point along the edges of the unit cell. So they very intuitively describe the size and orientation of our unit cell. Then we have translation vectors. These are a little bit more abstract, maybe a little bit harder to visualize, but they connect adjacent sites in the lattice. Now the drawback of axis vectors is that they do not uniquely describe all 14 Brave lattices. For example, we're showing a body center cubic a unit cell on the left, but in fact simple cubic, body center cubic, and face center cubic would have the same primitive axis vectors. 
So we, we can't uniquely describe all 14 Bravais lattices. Now with the primitive translation vectors, while a little bit more abstract, those do describe all 14 Bravais lattices uniquely. And we're calling these primitive lattice vectors in that they're as short as possible. They point to adjacent sites in the lattice. Now if we know the axis vectors, which are the A's on this page, we can actually calculate translation vectors from that if we also know the symmetry that we're interested in. And that's summarized on this page. We can talk about lattice vectors that are not necessarily primitive. What a lattice vector does is connect one point on the lattice to some other point, can be any point. And so that vector is a lattice vector. Now, if we've defined our primitive lattice vectors correctly, we should be able to get from that first sight in the lattice to the second light with an integer combination of the primitive lattice vectors. If we can't do that, something's wrong. Either we have incorrect primitive lattice vectors, we've drawn our lattice incorrectly, or our original lattice vector is not correct. So lattice vectors are really anything as long as they're an integer combination of the primitive lattice vectors. Then we come to a strange concept if you haven't seen this before, but something called the reciprocal lattice. We start with the direct lattice. This is the lattice that you can touch and hold. This is the thing that you look at and is real. And it is described by three translation vectors, which I'm showing in blue. Now, notice this unit cell has a periodic arrangement of planes going from left to right. So I'll, I'll outline one plane. The next plane's over here, and I'll outline it. This plane, in fact, repeats itself from left to right and also right to left. And it does that out to infinity. So we can pair off T1 and T3, two vectors define a plane. So it's defining this plane. We can construct now a third vector that is perpendicular to that plane and also whose magnitude is 2 pi divided by the distance between adjacent planes. And we're calling that capital T2 here. So we've paired off T1 and T3. We have a plane. That plane repeats itself. And so we define a vector that is perpendicular to those planes and has a magnitude 2, by, 2 pi divided by the spacing between those planes. Well, there's more planes that we can define. T2 and T3 define a plane. This plane repeats itself. We can construct a vector that is perpendicular to that plane and whose magnitude is 2 pi divided by the spacing between those planes. And there's one more. We have T1 and T2. Those define a plane. And this plane repeats itself. So we can construct a third vector which is perpendicular to that plane and whose magnitude is 2 pi divided by the spacing between the planes. Well, we've just come up with three more vectors. Those vectors define a unit cell in reciprocal space. In fact, those are the primitive lattice vectors of the reciprocal lattice. Now, likewise, we can pair off these reciprocal lattice vectors and construct a new set of vectors, and it turns out those are the primitive vectors of the direct lattice. And so we can go back and forth. The direct lattice vectors can always predict the reciprocal lattice vectors and vice versa. And so, and it's a unique thing. A direct lattice has only one reciprocal lattice and that reciprocal lattice has only one direct lattice. So that's the construction of the reciprocal lattice. In a way, it's kind of a map of how the direct lattice is periodic. Quick chart here, the reciprocal of simple cubic is simple cubic. The reciprocal lattice of body-centered cubic is face-centered cubic. And because of that, then the reciprocal of face-centered cubic is body-centered cubic. 
and the reciprocal of hexagonal is also hexagonal. Those are the most common ones. Well, we don't have to do this graphically. We can do this mathematically. And here's the equations where we can go back and forth between direct and reciprocal lattice vectors. Once we have the reciprocal lattice vectors, which I'm showing as capital T's, we can talk about primitive reciprocal lattice vectors and just ordinary reciprocal lattice vectors. The ones we constructed a few slides ago, those were the primitive reciprocal lattice vectors. Well, if we have some integer combination of those primitive reciprocal lattice vectors, we end up with just a reciprocal lattice vector. It may not be primitive, but it is still a reciprocal lattice vector. This slide is more just to summarize the geometry of a hexagonal array. Um, if we lay out a, a hexagon, the angles in the triangles here, they're 60 degrees. Each side of the triangle has the same length A, that would be the lattice spacing. The height of one of those triangles is the square root of 3 over 2 times A. The total width of this hexagon is 2A and the total height is the square root of 3 times A. Um, not really a lot of theory to discuss here, but this summary of the geometry is very useful when we start building devices on grids and modeling them. Here's a summary of how to calculate the primitive translation vectors for the direct lattice and the primitive translation vectors for the reciprocal lattice. And notice for the direct lattice the magnitudes are some function of A and on the reciprocal side it's 2 pi over A. That makes sense from what we've been talking about. Given the reciprocal lattice vectors, we can construct the Berlouin zone, the irreducible Berlouin zone. We can label the key points of symmetry, and then more importantly, we can calculate those key points of symmetry as some combination of those primitive translation vectors of the reciprocal lattice. And so that's summarized here for you. Okay, let's remember what a grating vector is. The utility of a grating vector, it lets us describe the, the periodic modulation and dielectric constant, for example, as just a cosine k dot r. r is position and k is our grating vector. Like a wave vector, the grating vector has two pieces of information. The magnitude is 2 pi divided by the spacing between equal planes in the grating. And the direction is perpendicular to these planes of equal dielectric constant, if you will. So a grating vector is just like a wave vector, and in fact we use it in the same way. It's just not describing a wave, it's describing a, a stationary modulation in the dielectric constant, if you will. So that's a grating vector. Now here's the, the big realization here. When we constructed our reciprocal lattice, we were coming up with our reciprocal translation vectors and they were defined as being perpendicular to planes with a magnitude 2 pi divided by the spacing between those planes. That is a grating vector. So in fact, those primitive translation vectors of the reciprocal lattice are grating vectors. And there's such an intimate tie-in there that very often periodic structures are modeled in reciprocal space instead of the lattice space because there's a much more intimate relationship between the grating vectors and wave vectors and diffraction in those lattices. I'll also mention, although we won't use them much in this course, is Miller indices. So we said that a reciprocal lattice vector is an integer combination of the primitive reciprocal lattice vectors and that a lattice vector really defines some plane in the direct lattice that repeats itself. Miller indices are just the integers, the P, Q, and R. So that set of integers are Miller indices and it's describing some plane in the direct lattice. Next, as it turns out, even though we've been drawing unit cells, we've been drawing what 
we would call the conventional unit cell. It's a nice pretty picture that makes intuitive sense. However, it's not that useful in electromagnetic modeling. What we want to define are primitive unit cells, and these are often much, much smaller than the conventional unit cell. And in, in an area like computational electromagnetics, where that size costs you, we want to minimize that volume of space where we have to find solutions. So what we're going to do is look at the Wigner Seitz cell, which is just one way of constructing a primitive unit cell. So what I'm drawing here are the conventional unit cells drawn as black bars and the gray spheres. What we'll do is we'll pick one of these sites in the lattice, one sphere, and we will construct the volume of space that is closest to this point than any other point in the lattice. And that volume of space I've drawn in yellow here. Makes maybe a little bit more sense. We look at the body center cubic and we want the volume of space that's closest to this site in the lattice than any other site. And what you'll see, if we pair off these two points, we see that there's going to be a plane bisecting those two points. And on the underside of that plane, all of that area is, or volume is closest to this site and above this plane is closest to this point. So you'll see this little hexagon shape and that's why that plane is there. It's really defining the separation between these two points. And likewise, we can pair off all of these adjacent points and we see a plane bisecting the two. And so that's how we construct this volume. If we look at the face center cubic lattice, we see uh, we have a, a, volume of, or a volume around the center place that's closer to it than any other site in the lattice. So if we look at these, Right away, we can see that the unit cell of the body-centered cubic looks the most circular. So we'll pick up on that in a little bit. Next, we have a Berlouin zone. On the previous slide, we constructed the Wigner sites unit cell. Now, if we go to reciprocal space and construct the Wigner sites unit cell, we don't call it the Wigner Seitz unit cell anymore. In fact, we call that the Berlouin zone. So a Berlouin zone and the Wigner Seitz unit cells, this is really the same concept. It's just that the Berlouin zone is constructed in reciprocal space and the Wigner Seitz cell is constructed in real space. So let's talk more about the symmetry. We mentioned before that certain lattices have higher symmetry than others. What that means is that its Berlouin zone is more spherical. The more spherical the Berlouin zone, the more symmetry a lattice has. So I've ranked the lattices from low to high symmetry. The lowest symmetry is the, tri the, the triclinics. We have all your other lattices, and then the highest symmetry lattices are your cubic symmetries. And then even ranking those in order, simple cubic has the lowest, then body-centered, then face-centered cubic. So let's think about the face center cubic for a minute. The reciprocal lattice of face center cubic is the body center cubic. And remember I said the unit cell of the body center cubic has the most spherical unit cell. So that means the Berlouin zone of face centered cubic is constructed from a body center cubic reciprocal lattice. So the Berlouin zone of the face center cubic lattice is the most spherical. Even better than face center cubic is diamond. And of all things that repeat, that have a basis it's called, the diamond lattice has the most symmetry. Well it turns out there's something that can even beat diamond and that's an aperiodic, a pseudo periodic lattice. So if we look at this, it looks kind of like it's periodic, but there's enough randomness in it that we can't really define a unit cell such that if we stacked it, it would construct the overall lattice because it's random. In a pseudo-periodic lattice, it turns out the Berlouin zone becomes much more of a statistical concept. And so the Berlouin zone is a little bit blurred, if you will, and in fact becomes much more spherical than anything with a basis that repeats like diamond or face center cubic. So the aperiodics win in terms of achieving the highest degrees of symmetry.
Well, it turns out sometimes there's even more symmetry than we can exploit. So let's look at a square unit cell and maybe it has a dielectric rod in the middle. And we want to calculate the electric field everywhere. Well, right away, we can see that the left half and the right half are mirror images. So why don't we really just calculate the electric field on the right half and then mirror those over to reconstruct the left half? We've just cut our problem by half. Likewise, the bottom and the top are mirror images of each other. So why not let's just calculate the field on the top half and mirror those down to reconstruct the bottom half. Well, since we have left, right, and top down symmetry, really what this says is we only have to calculate the electric field in one quadrant of this. And once we know the electric field in this quadrant, we can map it to the other three quadrants to plot the electric field everywhere. So we've just cut our problem size down by 75%. Well, there's even more symmetry. If we turn this unit cell 90 degrees, it looks the same again. So what this translates into, we only have to calculate the electric field within this triangle. If we know the electric field everywhere in this triangle, we can map those to the other half of this quadrant. And then once we know the electric field in this quadrant, we could map it over to the other quadrants, the other three quadrants, and then we know the electric field everywhere. So there's potentially even more symmetry to exploit to simplify our analysis. That brings us into the concept of the irreducible Brillouin zone. The irreducible Brillouin zone is the smallest volume of space inside the Brillouin zone that if we calculate a solution in that entire volume, we can map it to every other point in the Brillouin zone and we would know everything about the lattice. And we construct the irreducible Brillouin zone by looking at the symmetry of the original lattice and looking, okay, does that have left-right symmetry, up-down symmetry, rotational symmetry, and we can sometimes whittle the Brillouin zone down to something much smaller. And that's called the irreducible Brillouin zone. And we always do analysis only in the irreducible Brillouin zone because analyzing it outside of that is really just a waste because we can map any point anywhere even in the, the extended reciprocal lattice but anywhere in the Brillouin zone to a point inside the irreducible Brillouin zone. Now sometimes there just isn't that extra symmetry there and the irreducible Brillouin zone and, Brill and the full Brillouin zone end up the same thing at that point. Now let's talk about electromagnetic waves inside periodic structures. So before we get to that, Let's say we have a dielectric rod and we have a nice uniform plane wave described by a K vector and it passes through that rod. Well, in the rod, that delays the wave. So we get a wave front that's deformed. But the wave front is deformed in a pattern that kind of looks like the original dielectric rod. Now, if the dielectric rod were heart shaped, we probably won't get a heart shaped electric field, but there is some resemblance of the original object in the shape of the electric field. Now if we had a periodic array of these cylinders and we had a nice plane wave that passed through it, we would see these same perturbations. And the big conclusion here is that waves in periodic structures take on the same periodicity as their host. So notice these repeat on my screen, it's about every inch. Well, the field, the pattern of the field repeats about every inch. That doesn't mean if these are heart shaped, we're gonna see a heart in the electric field. It just means the symmetry is the same. So we're repeating every inch and the field would repeat every inch. The waves in periodic structures take on the same periodicity as the structure that they're in. From this comes something called the block theorem. And what I said on the previous slide is a little bit wrong, and here's the correction to that. So it turns out the field inside a periodic structure, E, that's the overall total field, we can separate into two components. Well, it's traveling in some direction, so we have this plane wave phase tilt term, if you will. And then it also has this amplitude envelope. And it turns out, 
it's this amplitude here. That is the thing that actually takes on the same exact periodicity as the structure that it's in. This plane wave term just looks like itself. It doesn't take on the symmetry of what it is in. It's this amplitude envelope. So the overall electric field starts to look like what I call a bumpy plane wave. So here's my cartoon drawing of a bumpy plane wave trucking along in the to the lower right direction. Well, this bumpy plane wave we can decompose into a plane wave term, which looks like a nice well-behaved plane wave traveling in the same direction as our bumpy plane wave. And then we have this amplitude function, which is riding on top of this plane wave term that takes on the same periodicity as the structure that it is in. So very often people ask, well, what do those waves actually look like? So here's two simulations. We have the same lattice. Uh, the one on the left is normal incident, so we see a plane wave coming in, it enters the lattice, and it leaves. Inside the lattice we see this red horizontal line, and then blue, and then red, and blue, and it repeats itself. So we do see that there's a plane wave-like phenomenon happening, yet it goes from dark to bright red, dark red to orange, red to orange, and, and the blue fluctuate as well. So there's bumps on this plane wave. It's not a pure smooth plane wave. Out here we have pure smooth plane waves. In here they're almost like a plane wave, but they're bumpy. Same lattice, but now we're coming in at some angle of incidence. Notice that wave refracts into this lattice. But we still see that we have basically red going along this diagonal and then blue along this diagonal and then red again. So we have a plane wave traveling essentially in this direction to the lower right. It's refracted a little bit, but it's bumpy. And then once it leaves the lattice, we get a nice smooth looking plane wave again. So that's what they actually look like. These are finite difference frequency domain simulations. Now let's think about this more mathematically using these translation vectors that we talked about previously. Well, we said it has to be inside a periodic structure. Well, if a structure is periodic, what does that mean? That means if I take my dielectric function, R is position, and if I add to position any translation vector, I should get my dielectric function just at position R. Because adding any integer combination of translation vectors, primitive translation vectors, takes me back to the same point in the lattice. So this has to be true if the structure is periodic. Well from the block theorem we said that that amplitude function multiplying the wave, this is the thing that takes on the same exact symmetry as the structure that it's in. Well if that's the case it has to obey the same condition for being periodic where we add any translation vector to it and it looks the same. So here we've defined how our dielectric function and that amplitude portion of our wave are periodic in the same exact way. So here's an example of periodicity in one dimension. We have a three-dimensional device. All devices are always three-dimensional, just sometimes we can talk about them in two or even one dimension. So by one-dimensional periodicity we would have a grading vector starting from the upper left going to the lower right that's perpendicular to these grooves in the direction I'm flashing the, the little cursor now and that's just in one dimension. It's uniform in this direction in the y direction and then in the z direction we don't really have a grading at all we have some different layers but we do have periodicity going along the x-axis so the x-axis is the only one that has periodicity so that means we could, we could reduce what we wrote on the previous slide to this. The dielectric function x, y, z equals the dielectric function sum plus some integer times the period in x. And then the same thing for the amplitude portion. Well, y and z aren't doing anything interesting here, so let's just drop them explicitly. They're still implicit here. And we could write our dielectric function and our amplitude function this way to see how they're periodic in one dimension. So a bit more compact notation. Okay, now we're ready to talk about band gaps and why we have them. So 
before we get to a band gap, we have to understand what a band diagram is and how they're constructed. So for right now, we are going to wrap a black box around solving the wave equation. Although last semester we saw how this is done and specifically here, I, I would probably be referring to the plane wave expansion method, although find a difference method and other techniques can be used. But let's say we're solving this as an eigenvalue problem. And what it takes as an input is the description of the unit cell and the block wave vector. Remember, the block wave vector has two pieces of information. It has the direction of the wave we're interested in the lattice. And the magnitude is 2 pi over the spacing of that wave or the periodicity of that wave. So we're asking this black box a question. We say, here's the unit cell. And what waves travel through this in this direction that have this spatial period? And we ask that question of Maxwell's equations. Well, our solver turns the crank, and out comes a whole list of answers. Our eigenvectors show us pictures of the fields. Our eigenvalues tell us the frequencies, and we get a list. We, and and our, our solver says, oh, that happens at, at this frequency, and this frequency, and this frequency, and this frequency. So what we do, given that information, is we iterate through all of the block wave vectors marching around the perimeter of the balloon zone. Let's talk about this horizontal axis for a little bit more. Um, here's our full balloon zone of this lattice. This is a, a face center cubic lattice. Then we look at our irreducible balloon zone. And the reason it whittles down to this volume is because we had spherical bases. So here is our irreducible balloon zone. Rather than set up a triple loop that goes and iterates through the volume of this, instead in a band diagram, we just march around the perimeter of this in some, some pattern. So what I did is I chose going from U to X to Gamma to L to K to W, and we could go back to U or not. So here's the path that we've chosen. And then we'll stretch this out into a line and we will make that the horizontal axis of our band diagram. Now, if we were to oversimplify what this horizontal axis is, I would say we're just changing direction through the lattice. But that's not quite true because we're also changing the spatial period. For example, in this region between gamma and L, we're actually talking about the same direction through the lattice. Gamma is at the center of the lattice, L is at the boundary. So as we march along this line, we're talking about a wave traveling in the same direction. It's just here, I'll have a, a huge spatial period, and it gets shorter and shorter and shorter until we get to L. So the reality is, this horizontal axis, we're not only changing direction through the lattice, we're changing the spatial period of, of the wave we're talking about as well. So what we do is we set up an array, probably have 200 points along this horizontal axis. So we're doing this in very fine steps. So we pick our block wave vector, and we call that eigenvalue solver, and we plot all those discrete frequencies. Then we move to the next point and plot all the discrete frequencies. And move to the next point, plot all the discrete frequencies. And if we do this fine enough, what we see are these discrete frequencies line up and form bands. And the bands tell us where all of those allowed modes are. And along this vertical axis is frequency that we, we normalize in some way. So here's a movie of constructing a band diagram. And what you see on the left is the, the full Berlouin zone. Here you see the irreducible Berlouin zone. And this blue vector is the block wave vector that we're currently modeling. So you'll see as we travel from left to right in the block diagram, you'll see this block wave vector dancing around the Berlouin zone. And wherever it's pointing, that's the one that we're modeling. And what we do is we plot all of the frequencies that come out for a given block wave vector, move to the next one, plot all the frequencies, and we fill this band diagram in, in moving left to right. So let's watch that happen. So I'll point out a few things. Notice going from gamma to L that 
block wave vectors always pointing in the same direction. So in fact, going from gamma to L, we're only changing spatial period. And likewise, I could say going from X to gamma, the same thing. We're talking about waves in the same direction, just changing their spatial period. So that's constructing band diagrams and hopefully gives you a high level picture of how they are constructed. And later on in the semester, uh, we're gonna learn a lot more things that we can learn from the band diagram. I will touch on a few in the following slides. So here's just five things, and there, there's probably more that we can get from a band diagram. One, we can identify if there's any band gaps. Those are spans of frequency where there are no bands, all the way across the, the band diagram. And when there's a band gap, in fact, that structure acts like a mirror because there's no allowed modes and it reflects. We can estimate what the transmission and reflection spectra will look like. We can determine the phase velocity of a wave. We can determine the group velocity or the, how, how fast power actually travels. We can tell all kinds of things about dispersion in the lattice. And later on in the semester, we're going to go nuts with this and actually learn how to engineer the dispersion of a lattice and the band gaps. So here, there's a lot on this slide. We'll take it one piece at a time. So at first, just see a band diagram on the left with the, with the blue lines. Those are the bands of this periodic lattice that I'm showing at the lower left. Then I draw its Berlouin zone, and I label its key points of symmetry, and then we can see those same key points of symmetry along the horizontal axis. Now, if I take this same lattice and I average the refractive index and just make it a homogeneous lattice with the average refractive index and then calculate the bands, those are the dashed green lines. So very often we'll call those the light lines. Now, notice very, very close to gamma. So remember, gamma is at the center of the Berlin zone. That is zero. So when our block wave vector is zero, that means infinite wavelength. So what we're talking about here are very, very long wavelengths relative to the lattice. Such a long wavelength that the wave can't interact with the lattice yet. And in fact, we do just see an average. And that's why these light lines, which really is the average, and the blue lines, which is physically what would happen in the lattice, they're really the same thing here. But eventually, as we, as we move away from gamma, and that spatial period of the wave is getting shorter and shorter and shorter, at some point it becomes short enough that it starts to interact with the lattice and bounce around. And that's where we see a deviation between the actual band and the light band. And that is dispersion. That is happening because the wave is interacting with the lattice. Whereas down here, the wavelength is just way too long. The lattice is way, way too sub-wavelength to, to get any kind of wave interaction. But up here it is possible. So as the blue bands bend away from the light lines, that is dispersion. Well, if we look at the slope of the line connecting gamma to whatever point on the band that we're interested in, the slope of that line tells us phase velocity. That's the speed at which phase appears to move. Those are the wave fronts. If we look at the normal to the surface, that gives us a measure of group velocity. So group velocity is more of a, a derivative in K space, and it's normal to those surfaces. Uh, and that's that's the, the speed at which power would move. And, and more on this later in the semester. The next thing we can look at, we can identify bands that go all the way across where there are no bands. So no blue line crosses in this gray region. We would call this gray region a complete photonic band gap. And there's another one up here that's even wider. No bands, that's a complete band gap. Another one up here, a really skinny one here, and there probably isn't any more, but in principle, I, I guess there could be. Now, if propagation is mostly restricted to be in the vertical direction, maybe we have a wave at normal instance hitting this lattice, there's really nothing traveling at any kind of diagonal, and for the most part, 
we can look at waves just within this range. And we, here we see we actually have a pretty wide band gap. I would call this a partial band gap. It's not a complete band gap because waves at different angles, you know, for example, down here, that would be blocked at normal incidence. If we come in at an angle, suddenly there's an allowed state. So we could get transmission through the lattice. So I would just call this a partial band gap. Well, I used rigorous coupled wave analysis and I modeled transmission vertically through this lattice. So that's the Y to gamma direction. And here's that simulation. And since the vertical axis is frequency, I also made the vertical axis here frequency and I scaled them to be the same. And notice the transmittance dips here. And notice the width of this dip. It's exactly this. We're seeing the partial band gap. Now, if we came in at an angle, maybe it's, it's coming in in the, the N gamma direction, we would expect to see a narrower dip. So we look at this other band, partial band gap, and we see it here, another partial band gap, we see it here, this little skinny one, and we see it rather weakly. Where there's a lot of bands, the transmittance gets pretty crazy, um, but we can look at the photonic band diagram and make a pretty good guess as to what the transmission and reflection will look like. This band diagram is a lot faster to calculate than this transmittance. So that's the value in it. So there's a lot we can interpret from band diagrams and we'll talk more about that later in the semester and we'll talk about how to use this to engineer things about a lattice. So band diagrams are very nice, but they're missing information. A few slides ago, we started with the Berlouin zone. We whittled that down to the irreducible Berlouin zone. And then we said, we're just going to march around the, peri the perimeter of the irreducible Berlouin zone. Well, in fact, we really needed to calculate the solution at every single point in that entire volume of the irreducible Berlouin zone. Well, there can be thousands and thousands of points throughout the middle, but maybe only a few dozen to, to resolve the perimeter around the, the irreducible Berlouin zone. And it is said that 99% of the time that any kind of band extremes will occur at the key points of symmetry. And nobody ever really spells out where the exceptions are. I actually don't know. I'd be very interested in that. I have some thoughts if I was going to look for that, but I've never, never looked for it. But the point is, we are potentially missing information. So, what does a full band diagram look like? Well, on the left here is the full Berlouin zone. So rather than march through some perimeter of an irreducible Berlouin zone, we are going to fill in the entire space. So this entire two-dimensional space represents a whole bunch of different block wave vectors. And so now we need a third dimension. So for every point in this square, we can calculate a block wave vector because we have a y and an x component. And we can plot the frequencies, if you will, coming out vertically. So this square in three dimensions is actually drawn down here. So the square at the bottom is that square on the left. So we will set up a loop and we will iterate through this entire Berlouin zone and for every point we will plot the discrete frequencies and we'll do that when and when we're done we have what we see on the right here it, our bands become sheets for a two-dimensional lattice now three-dimensional lattices we actually have a four-dimensional set of data and it gets looking kind of crazy but it's easy to see with a two-dimensional lattice so this is the full band diagram for a two-dimensional lattice. Clearly, there's a lot more calculations happening here. Our next concept is isofrequency contours. And it turns out we need those full bands to calculate these isofrequency contours. So let's go back and recall the, the phase and power flow. And we had a discussion on index ellipsoids. And it turns out these isofrequency contours that we'll learn how to construct in a minute are the index ellipsoids. But in this case, it's for periodic structures. 
So here we have a two-dimensional two material, I guess. And so we have uh, an index ellipsoid or a circle here. And we think of this more as a map of refractive index as a function of direction through the lattice. Although we know that the, the distance from the origin to the circle isn't exactly refractive index, it's the magnitude of the wave vector, but that conveys refractive index. So the vector that connects the origin to some point on the surface, that's the wave vector. That's the direction phase is trying to go. If we looked at the actual waves, they would appear to be moving in the direction of K. Now the power itself is defined differently. We construct a tangent to that point on the surface, and the vector orthogonal to that would be our pointing vector. That's the direction that power would flow. Well, when our index ellipsoid, if you will, is a circle, the k and the pointing vector are in the same direction. And we get programmed to think this way, that the waves and the power flow in the same direction. But in fact, that does not have to be the case. Let's look at what happens inside an anisotropic material. Now our index ellipsoid really is an ellipsoid. So we'll pick a point on the surface, the vector that connects the origin to that point, that's our wave vector. So our phase would appear to be flowing in this direction. However, the power is defined. We construct a tangent to that point on the surface, and the power is flowing in a direction normal to that tangent. So here, the pointing vector and the wave vector are in different directions. Phase and power are flowing in different directions. So how do we calculate these index ellipsoids for periodic structures? And it turns out we get some very interesting index ellipsoids. So let's start off on the left here. Here are the full band diagrams. What we'll do is we'll take this second band, the green band, and we'll fill in a bunch more points and we get this nice smooth looking surface. Then what we'll do is we will bisect it with planes. So this vertical axis is frequency. So these planes are really showing us constant frequency. So where it intersects that band is a band of constant frequency, an ISO frequency contour. But it's where that plane slices through the band. So this blue plane slices through the band, and I'm drawing a blue line to show that ISO contour. That's the intersection between the blue plane above and our band. Well, now we'll look at this gold band, and it slices through our band in the middle somewhere. So here's what the gold band looks like. And then we can look at the red band, and where it slices through, we see the red ISO contours. These are the index ellipsoids, and the index ellipsoid is different for different frequencies. And they're constructed from the full band diagram. So let's look at the ISO contours from the first band. Here's a full set of, of bands, and it gets crazy up here. But let's take the first band, and now we're over here on the right, and I'm not showing the planes, but they would give you cross sections. And if we look at the cross sections for this first order band, they look very circular. And in fact, they are very circular till we get out here. And that's because the spatial period is so long that it's not really producing any dispersion or any kind of interesting physics in the lattice. And in fact, the index ellipsoids or the ISO contours are circular simply because it's just seeing an average dielectric constant or average refractive index. So normally we don't draw the ISO contours with the full bands and all that. I just drew, showed you those pictures so that you could see how they're constructed. This is how it's normally presented. We show the lattice, and then we show the ISO contours, and somewhere we'd have to mention that you know this is taken from the second band, and the numbers here are the normalized frequency. And so later on, when we start to learn how to engineer the dispersion of these lattices, we'll be looking at the shapes of the lines. And it turns out when they're flat, some interesting things happen, self-collimation. But also interesting things happen when the bands are bent in. We can get negative refraction and other effects. So we get a lot of information from this, and we will use this to engineer the performance of periodic structures.